are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio. Mysteries of the Bible present King David, Poet Warrior. Enjoy and have a glorious day. He is celebrated as one of the greatest kings in history, a child chosen by God himself to become a slayer of giants. Well, one of the greatest mysteries about the story of David and Goliath is quite simply to ask the question, who really killed Goliath? He is thought to be the author of the Psalms, a gentle shepherd with a poetic nature. Was David a righteous leader or a bloody murderer? Why not both? He is none other than King David. But no historical mention of David is made outside the Bible. The biggest mystery of all is whether he even existed. You have scholars who say that the whole story is a late invention, that there was no David. In 1993, a stone fragment is unearthed at an archaeological site in northern Israel called Tel Dan. It would come as a surprise to scholars, a clue they had never expected. Would it end thousands of years of speculation about King David's existence? Who was King David? And what would be the ultimate destiny of one hand-picked by God? These are but a few of the mysteries of the Bible. Just outside the gates of ancient Jerusalem, a monument stands silently for one of the sons of King David, Absalom. The tomb is revealing not so much as an artifact of history, but for what it suggests about the mysterious destiny of Absalom's father, the young shepherd boy who would become God's chosen king. For centuries, people have come here to throw stones at the tomb and to warn wayward children about the cost of misbehaving. The Bible tells us that Absalom would rise up against his father in open revolt, bringing shame and the wrath of God against all of Israel. Some believe that the story of David and his rebellious son is merely fiction, that the tale of King David is nothing but allegory. But as archaeologists digging in the Holy Land well know, the earth has not revealed all of its secrets. It is here, in the summer of 1993, that a stone fragment is discovered by archaeologist Avram Biran at a site in Israel called Tel Dan. Some have called it the discovery of the century. The find creates a frenzy in the academic community. Dr. Biran has found a great, a great archaeological find. In the 83rd year of his life, he's made the discovery of a lifetime. Concealed from sight for 2,900 years, 
It proclaims the battle victories of a major king in Syria during the 9th century before the Common Era. In part it reads, I fought against Israel and slew the king of the house of David. Do you have scholars who say that the whole story is a late invention? That there was no David? Then you have an archaeological find which refers to the house of David, the dynasty of David. So, if you needed that as proof, then here you have it. For the first time in history, a reference to an actual historical David is found outside the pages of the Bible. Now, to find at Dan, which is far away from Jerusalem, a reference to the dynasty of David, to the name David, was in itself an unusual event. It is a discovery which is, arguably, one of the most important archaeological finds since the unearthing of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is a tangible remains of a dynasty that would begin in the tiny hamlet of Bethlehem. One thousand years before the birth of Jesus, ancient Israel is just a budding nation, and David is merely a child. To God's dismay, the Israelites insist upon having a king. The prophet Samuel is chosen to anoint Saul, the new royal leader of Israel. Saul is a dark and brooding character who never finds favor in God's eyes. King Saul is continually subject to melancholy and fits of rage. A member of Saul's court suggests that a musician might be just the medicine needed to soothe the king's inner demons. And the Lord was sorry that he had ever made Saul king of Israel. Finally, the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul, for I have rejected him as king of Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, Take a vial of olive oil, and go to Bethlehem and find a man named Jesse, for I have selected one of his sons to be the new king. 1 Samuel 16, 1. The mystery to me about David's childhood is what in it made him David. This is one of the most interesting, vital, powerful characters in history. And we have only one hint. The one hint that we have is when Samuel came to David to anoint him, he was out back tending the sheep. And the idea that David as a child was a shepherd is a very powerful idea because you find often in the Bible that leaders, Moses, David, Jacob, are shepherds because they learn how to treat those who are dependent on them. And so, a young shepherd boy begins his journey to the throne. He could not know how perilous a journey it would be. One of them said he knew a young fellow in Bethlehem, the son of a man named Jesse, who was not only a talented harp player, but was handsome, brave, and strong, and had good solid judgment. What's more, he added, the Lord is with him. 1 Samuel 16, 18. David leaves his family and travels to Saul's court. And indeed, when he plays his harp for Saul, it has a calming effect on the troubled king. The relationship between Saul and David is a very complex one. Saul's first reaction to David is very positive. We're told that he loved David, uh, which is a term that has not only emotional but political overtones. That is, he, he became committed and uh, he, he became committed and and accepted David as an important member of his staff. In addition to being a musician, David is also a poet. While he is largely believed to be the author of many of the Psalms, some scholars disagree. 
The idea that David had anything to do with the Psalms is probably a very early tradition that associates David's role early on in Saul's court as a singer and a player with the fact that the Psalms were documents that were sung and used in worship. That's probably why the association was made. But we have very strong doubts as to whether any of those Psalms were actually written by David. It's a nice tradition, but highly unlikely. I think that David did write many of the Psalms and that if you read them carefully, they do reflect the evolution of his own character and his own story. Although a success at poetry and music, David will also need other skills, the skills of a fighter. He is headed on a collision course with King Saul. That collision course would begin here, the Elah Valley. For here is where the Israelites are confronted by the Philistines and their giant warrior, Goliath. Then Goliath, the Philistine champion, came out of the ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was a giant of a man, measuring over nine feet tall and his armor-bearer walked ahead of him with a huge shield. 1 Samuel 17, 1. David recognized a rule of battle that became more important as history progressed, which is, if you can strike from a distance, it doesn't matter how strong your enemy is. Then he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag and armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, started across to Goliath. When the Philistine began moving closer to attack, David ran quickly to engage him. Reaching into his bag, he took out a stone, which he slung and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank in, and the man fell to the ground upon his face. 1 Samuel 17:48. It is one of the most famous stories in the Bible. What is less known is that in later verses the Bible contradicts itself. We have this wonderful story about David being the conqueror of Goliath, but then later on in the Bible there's a kind of cast-off sentence that says, oh and by the way, Elhanan, who of course was the one who killed Goliath. And the reader has to stop and say, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> I thought that was David. In fact, the mysterious Elchanan is mentioned twice as the slayer of Goliath, once in 2 Samuel and once in the book of Chronicles. Nothing else is known about this character. Was Elchanan the actual slayer of Goliath? Was the story rewritten to honor a new king? The original story of Goliath has been certainly expanded now to take in David and to be part of his colorful history. David returns triumphantly to Saul's court, a new young hero. All of a sudden, the jealousy is almost unbearable, and that begins slowly to push Saul over the edge. The king's household is now an uneasy place, and the stage is set for royal intrigue, dramatic and deadly, as King Saul sets out to kill David. Having just returned from his triumph over Goliath, David's popularity in Israel is growing, even it seems at the expense of King Saul. Perhaps the greatest mystery in the Bible is why God falls in love with certain people. God falls in love with Abraham, God falls in love with Moses, and God falls in love with David. And from his youth, David has this magic and charisma that God is with him. Today we would use that word. We would say David had a certain charisma and a certain skill and a certain luck. But in that time, it was spoken of very differently. That what David had was around him the presence of God. 
This would not prevent him from feeling the wrath of an increasingly jealous King Saul. In a fit of torment, Saul hurls a spear at David's head, which narrowly misses him. It is only the first of several attempts Saul is to make on David's life. To escape certain death, David flees into the Judean wilderness with a small band of men. The period of David as outlaw is another mystery which I would really like to know more about. What we know is that David went into the Judean wilderness, south of Jerusalem, east of Hebron, in that whole wild area on the edge of the desert. We know that discontented men, 400 of them, says the Bible, discontented men joined him there. King Saul pursues David into the wilderness. According to ancient Hebrew legend, Saul and his men are about to enter a cave in which David is hiding. God sends a spider to weave a web over the mouth of the cave. Saul's men pass by, thinking it could not possibly be occupied. Still in pursuit of David and his men, King Saul tracks David to a desert oasis by the Dead Sea called En Gedi. It is here, among En Gedi's waterfalls and lush green gardens, that David gets the opportunity to stop running for his life. Saul wanders into a cave in which David is hiding, and for a moment, the king is utterly vulnerable to the man he is hunting. Now's the time, David's men whispered to him. Today is the day the Lord will deliver Saul into your power. 1 Samuel 24, 4 And David said, I can't kill him. He's the anointed of the Lord. He's the king. But he crept up and he cut off a corner of his coat. Symbolic. He cut off a corner of his coat. And Saul got up and went out and he never knew anything that happened. And when Saul got to the other side of the mountain and David was safe, he called out Saul. Saul said, is that you, my son David? This love, hate, hate, love. He's come to kill him. He said, is that you, my son David? And David said, look, here's your coat. I could have killed you, and I didn't. Now know that I mean you no harm, said David. And Saul said, now I know that you mean me no harm. And the story ended in tears. But Saul went back to Jerusalem, or Saul went back to his capital. And David stayed in the wilderness. Shortly after the episode at En Gedi, David receives word that King Saul and his son Jonathan have both been killed in battle with the Philistines at Mount Gilboa. Although Saul had tried hard to kill him, David goes into mourning. But despite this, is it possible that David actually had a hand in Saul's murder? Essentially what happens, according to the text, is that a runner comes to David, says Saul was on the verge of death, hounded by the Philistines at Mount Gilboa, and asked his armor bearer to kill him, or a passing Amalekite to kill him. The Amalekite says he obliges, uh, David kills the Amalekite. Uh, David kills the Amalekite. Since it may be possible that David orchestrated the death of King Saul, could the biblical writer have been favoring David? This is, somebody kills your enemy, and then you kill the person who kills your enemy. And there is not a paper trail to you anymore. There's no one who can connect you with this death. We are told repeatedly, David, he wasn't, he must not have been at the Battle of Gilboa. Protests of that sort make one wonder whether contemporaries were not saying that David was responsible for the death of Saul. With King Saul and his son Jonathan now out of the way, David begins to rise to power. It is 1000 BCE. The Holy Land is made up of a series of loosely connected tribes, with the Kingdom of Judah in the south and Israel to the north. 
The land of Israel is not the only active region on earth at this time. In Egypt, wigs are being worn for the first time, often interwoven with jewelry. In China, the first mathematics textbook is published, covering algebra and geometry. And in Northern Europe, gold is being fashioned into jewelry. A spiral design is the most common motif. David is crowned by the elders of Judah, but Saul's other son, Ishbal, is crowned as ruler over the northern kingdom of Israel. For two years, civil war between the two kingdoms grips the nation. It is a classic struggle for power between David and the surviving son of King Saul. And it is not without intrigue or bloodshed. There is also a personal animosity that is said to develop between David's general Joab and Abner, who is uh, Lord of the North. Uh, David invites Abner to Hebron for peace talks. Uh, Abner in the text says, David, yes, we know you should be king of Israel. I'm going to betray my master Ishbal and make you, David, king of all Israel. And as Abner is leaving the talk, Joab, David's right-hand man, murders Abner and leaves him dead in the street. First, the general of the forces opposing David is eliminated. Next, the king opposing David, none other than Ishbal, son of Saul, is murdered in his sleep. David profited greatly from the deaths of these two people. And that there's a certain likelihood that accusations were rolling around at the time that he was the one who had ordered these assassinations. One of the interesting things about David's eventual rise to power is that as he gets closer to the throne, there seems to be a kind of moral failure to the point where I'm afraid we'd have to say that David's trail to the throne is drenched in blood. Now, the text tries in many ways to avoid implicating David directly, but it's it's hard to avoid. I mean, it's his minions, it's his men who are constantly involved in this. Some scholars believe 2 Samuel may have been written in response to formal allegations of murder brought against King David at the time. The oldest stories about David are not only favorable to him, but they seem to be defending him. Uh, as if in his lifetime he was suspected of wrongdoing. And certainly if you think about the story of his rise to power, how he became king, there are a number of things along the way that would have been suspicious. It's probably not fair to say that the people writing the books of Samuel and Kings are responding to accusations. They're writing political laudatory biography. They're writing about a hero whom they worship. They're writing about a man whom they consider to be the paragon of all virtues, and they have a problem because he was rough and crude and nasty and cruel and lecherous. So the amazing thing that despite all of the hero worship of King David, the fact is that he comes out as a real person, warts and all. And this makes it, in my opinion, extraordinary political biography, especially for those days. Whatever the answer, the consolidation of power by David, which stems from the elimination of his enemies, results in the birth of the first united Israelite nation in history. All the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. King David made a pact with them before God, and they anointed David king over Israel. 2 Samuel 5 And so, the house of David is established. God's chosen king finally sits upon the throne. As the new ruler of the unified country, David immediately seeks to establish a capital. He decides on a smallly located between the north and the south. It's his Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem, like Washington or Ottawa, is on the so-called, you know, the sort of Mason-Dixon line uh, between the North and the South, and thus is a perfect center, unencumbered by traditions either nickly, for the construction of an artificial capital. The people of Jerusalem resist King David's efforts to turn their city into Israel's new capital. But David and his men discover a way into the city, a fortified water shaft attached to a hundred foot long tunnel. Dug through the area's natural limestone, it is Jerusalem's lifeline to water. Modern archaeology has provided evidence of the authenticity of the biblical story. Uh, this is called Warren Shaft because it was first excavated and explored by a British scholar in those Warren. Uh, again, there's a story in the Bible that may be related to this. According to that story, David and his men took Jerusalem by a ruse. They uh, were not able to break into the city, but they came in through the Sinor, uh, the uh, Bible says, and the Hebrew word Sinor is still used for water pipe. And so some scholars believe that is a reference to the shaft. And now you could come into the city that way, because if you uh, managed to find a spring, you could creep up through the shaft and emerge inside the city walls and open the gate. Of course, then the city would be yours. As the people of Jerusalem discovered, their shaft was vulnerable to penetration by their enemies. King David establishes the conquered city of Jerusalem as the new capital of a united country. He has finally consolidated his position as head of the new royal house of Israel. But trouble looms for King David in the form of a beautiful woman. Trouble because she is married to another man. The archaeological record is surprisingly sparse, especially for a king who ruled over ancient Israel for 40 years. The Bible says that David builds a temple on Mount Moriah in his new capital of Jerusalem. Today, the Dome of the Rock, a Muslim holy shrine, stands atop this location. No excavation has ever been allowed here. Allowed here. Muslim authorities would not permit it. Um, uh, for that matter, Israeli authorities wouldn't permit it either because the Temple Mount is sacred to Jewish uh, tradition as well. And so we have never been able to excavate. However, most of David's building projects would have been buried by more monumental projects uh, begun by later kings like Solomon and the succeeding kings of Israel. So I don't think we'll ever find a, a lot archaeologic directly with David. There was one significant piece of archaeological evidence dating back to the time of David. An unusual stone terrace built into the side of a hill in Jerusalem. This film, shot in the early 1960s, records that find. It was discovered by British archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon. Some scholars believe this is the Milo that's mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. The Bible says that David built a Milo, and in Hebrew the word means a filling of some sort. That doesn't make much sense. But if one identifies the Milo as these terraces, then it makes a lot of sense. Uh, in other words, the steep hillside south of the Temple Mount had to be terraced before uh, they could be developed as part of the urban development of Jerusalem. Interestingly, Kenyon herself would never know that her find related to the great king. It was dated accurately only after her death. With the exception of the Milo, nothing has been found that can be linked directly to King David. Not even the location of his palace has ever been identified. It is only the pages of the Bible that can take us back to the rooftop of David's palace on what must have been a gentle evening some 3,000 years ago. One evening, David went for a stroll on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking her evening bath. 
He sent to find out who she was and was told she was Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Then David sent for her, and when she came, he slept with her. 2 Samuel 11, 2 And so, on the surface at least, a king has taken liberties with the wife of another man. David attempts a royal cover-up and recalls Bathsheba's husband Uriah from the battlefront, where he is fighting in General Joab's army. But, as is often the case with the Bible, not all is what it seems. Question number one, what is King David doing in Jerusalem, getting involved with Bathsheba, when as general-in-chief, he should have been at the battle, conducting and overseeing the ongoings of the war? Secondly, how old was this woman Bathsheba? What is she doing bathing on the rooftop, seemingly in public? How does that happen? Because that's how the whole story begins. As fate would have it, a complication soon arises. Bathsheba informs the king that she is pregnant. And then when Uriah comes home and David discovers that Bathsheba is pregnant, he tries to get Uriah to sleep with her so that when the baby comes, people won't know it belongs to the king. But Uriah says, how could I possibly sleep with my wife when my compatriots are out there fighting and dying? What do you mean? You return home if you're infatuated with your young bride. Nothing is going to stop you from going back to your wife. But he doesn't. He elects to stay with his men and proclaims this, this, this um, valor that as a soldier he cannot do what his soldiers aren't doing. The soldiers are sitting in the battlefield and he's returning to the comfort of his home. There's something missing. King David now makes what appears to be a particularly treacherous move. He gives his loyal soldier Uriah a sealed letter, Uriah's own death sentence. David wrote a letter to Joab to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab to put Uriah at the front of the hottest part of the battle and then pull back and leave him there to die. 2 Samuel 11, 14. And so Uriah follows the orders of his king, delivering his own order of execution to General Joab. It would seem that King David has used his power to kill an innocent man in order to seize his wife. But not all interpreters of the Bible see it this way. In the orthodox tradition of Judaism, Uriah's refusal to sleep with his wife is in direct defiance of King David's orders. And where there is defiance, there is potential for rebellion. The Orthodox tradition has a very specific view of this incident. The death of Uriah is seen as an act that is justifiable on the part of a king who is concerned about the security of his people. And seeing in Uriah potential rebellion, he wants to remove the problem before it becomes a problem. As a king, he has a right to do that. David marries Bathsheba, and all seems well. But God sends his prophet Nathan to confront David about Uriah's death. And there's a very dramatic scene where Nathan the prophet appears before the king and begins to tell him a wonderful story about how this man lost a prized possession. And he tells this kind of veiled story because Nathan, of course, knows all about the details of Bathsheba and the killing of her husband, Uriah. And at the end of this story, David jumps up from his throne and demands to know, who is it that has done this outrageous injustice? And Nathan turns to the king himself and says, you are the man. It's one of the most dramatic moments in the Bible. God said, why have you despised the laws of God and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah and stolen his wife. I vow that because of what you have done, 
I will cause your own household to rebel against you. And David confessed, I have sinned against the Lord. 2 Samuel 12, 9 David is a man who falls into a sin of appetite and then, I believe, becomes so panicked and worried about his own sin that he commits worse and worse transgressions to try to cover up for what he's done. And he finds himself all of a sudden in a huge web of evil and deceit. And I think he probably didn't even know how he got there in the first place. Yet some scholars are not so quick to judge. We don't stand in judgment of almost any figure in the Torah, in the Bible. Certainly not one like David to whom we attribute the highest accolades in terms of his character. However, there is a debate regarding the incident of Bathsheba and Uriah and David as to his motivations. And the Talmud itself, this body of oral tradition, does spend a little bit more time explaining what might really not be so apparently a sin, but that it was a lack of judgment. Whether a sin or merely bad judgment, the Bible tells us God punishes David by striking Bathsheba's child ill shortly after his birth. On the seventh day, the baby died. David's aides were afraid to tell him. When David saw them whispering, he realized what had happened. When whispering, he realized what had happened. Second Samuel 12, 18. And so King David loses a child. But the facts, as recorded in the Bible, remain. God's beloved king has slept with another man's wife and then had her husband killed when she became pregnant. Has the loss of the child been enough punishment for King David? The traditional place of David's burial is here on Mount Zion, outside the gates of Jerusalem. But the Bible tells us the king was buried in the ancient city of David, This tomb and structure date from the time of the Crusades, in the Middle Ages, 2,000 years after David lived and died. Whether or not he's actually buried in that location is one of the mysteries that we haven't really resolved. There are different traditions about this. The Sephardic community, certainly the, the North African, Spanish, um, Turkish communities believe that yes, that is the tomb of David. The European communities less so, and the European tradition, I should say. So I can't really say with any authority whether David is or isn't buried there. And frankly, it's not the tomb which is important. It's the connection between the individual and his God at a moment of prayer. David is most successful when he is portrayed as obedient to God's plan. And so the image that we have of David's descent is when David takes on the trappings of being merely a human monarch and not anymore the obedient servant of God. The prophecy Nathan foretold after David's affair with Bathsheba starts to be fulfilled. A series of terrible reversals begins. Absalom, David's son, attempts to take the throne. The Bible tells us that Absalom is much like his father, a charismatic personality who begins to amass a following in his own right. At the same time, his relationship with his father is less than ideal. So Absalom begins his own campaign to become king. David's kingship was looked back upon by all future generations as the perfect time in Israelite history. It wasn't true, by the way. In fact, it's doubtful whether he ever had the support of the whole country at any time. 
because the fact is that when his son revolted against him, Absalom, Absalom sought and received the support of the elders of Judah. With the backing of a group of followers, Absalom stages a coup, forcing his father to flee the city. The first thing Absalom does is sleep with his father's concubines as a clear signal that he has taken power. But King David has other plans. The boy who killed the mighty Goliath is not so easily swept aside. Together with General Joab and his troops, David returns and crushes his own son's uprising. David's relationship to his children is catastrophic. Absalom went in open revolt against him. Adoniahu, Adonijah, proclaimed himself king at the end, despite David's wish otherwise. Amnon raped his half-sister, Tamar. David never managed to deal with this. He never managed to cope with it. His family life was catastrophic. Absalom, the Bible says, is killed in his own revolt. He is the next of David's sons to die, and it is not a pleasant death. During the battle, Absalom came upon some of David's men, and as he fled on his mule, it went beneath the thick boughs of a great oak tree, and his hair caught in the branches leaving him dangling in the air. Joab took three daggers and plunged them into the heart of Absalom as he dangled alive from the oak tree. 2 Samuel 18, 9 Despite the fact that Absalom had attempted to take power from his father, King David mourns deeply for his lost son. Then the king broke into tears and went up to his room over the gate, crying as he went, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son, if only I could have died for you. 2 Samuel 18.33 Through the centuries, people have come to the tomb of Absalom to throw rocks in disgust at the man who tried to usurp God's chosen king. But David is old now, and his strength is waning. The Bible tells us that in his later years, King David is bedridden, and that no matter how many blankets are heaped upon his body, he is always cold. David died and was buried in the city of David. He had reigned over Israel for 40 years, and Solomon became the new king, replacing his father. And his kingdom prospered. 1 Kings 2.10 David's private life, including his marriages, presents a great problem for Jewish history. Because here is a man who was by all accounts a rascal, and yet he's the great king of the Golden Age. Now this is not so easy for pious Jews or Christians to deal with. And if I were dealing with David's private life from this point of view, I would in fact be dealing with the way that tradition looks back on a Golden Age and tries to conceal the fact that the Golden Age isn't so golden at all. The story of the young shepherd boy who would slay a giant and become one of Israel's greatest kings is still told to this day. Perhaps the very complexity of David's humanity is what fascinates us. A biblical hero of mythic proportions. A biblical hero of flesh and blood.
you are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio.